sometimes in life you can go too far. Take Crocodile Dundee, a classic movie, if ever there was one. And I can actually put up with Crocodile Dundee too. But Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles? Too far, Mr Hogan. Too far. This is a Skoda Enyaq, and we love the Enyaq at Auto EV. In fact, we prefer it over its siblings from Volkswagen and Audi. In other words, the ID4, ID5, and Audi Q4 e-tron. But this isn't a normal Enyaq. This is an Enyaq Coupe. And to go even further than that, it's an Enyaq Coupe VRS. So, is this the best Enyaq available? Is this, in other words, the Dark Knight Rises to the standard Enyaq's Batman Begins? In other words, is it better? Well, welcome to the new Skoda Enyaq Coupe VRS. Welcome to this week's road test review. And as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we go on to this week's road test review of the new Skoda Enyaq Coupe VRS, it is of course that time when I ask you to make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. After you've watched the videos, if you do enjoy them, make sure you give them a thumbs up and leave us some comments down below. Make sure you tell us what you think of the channel and of course your thoughts on the cars that we review. Now, if you are a regular viewer and a subscriber, um, you probably know that we road tested the Volkswagen ID.5 um, just a couple of months ago, um, which is sort of Volkswagen's uh, coupe SUV, if you like. And to be honest with you, I didn't really rate it. I didn't really think it, it was any better than the ID.4. In fact, I thought it was a bit of a worse car, if I'm honest with you. It's not as nice to look at, it's not quite as practical, and it doesn't really drive that memorably. But then, in some respects, the ID4 has never actually kind of really floated our boat. We've always preferred the ENIAC over it. And now, of course, Skoda have succumbed to this practice of making a coupe version of their SUV. And of course, we've now got it. It's the ENIAC coupe. But this isn't just a normal ENIAC, as I say. This is the VRS. This gets their sporty badge treatment as well. So this is the performance version of the ENIAC, which you can also now buy in full-size ENYAC form as well. So here's the question. Is this the ENYAC to have? Is this going to address some of the failings that we felt were there with the ID.5? And by giving it the VRS treatment, does this make it the ENYAC to desire? Well, of course, the only way we're going to find out is by putting it through the road test that actual car bars trust to deliver the definitive verdict on all the new EVs on sale. And that is, of course, the Auto EV one. Now, as always, we start with styling because style is what a coupe is all about. It's the reason you go for one, isn't it? And I've always loved the way that the standard Enyaq actually looks. And this is the VRS, so it does get a little bit of different treatment around about it to the other cars. And of course, it looks very much like an Enyaq from the front with these lovely kind of angry kind of looking headlights on it. But it gets Skoda's. Enyaq's crystal face as standard on the VRS. 131 LED lights on that, and I absolutely love that. Because the normal car, which has just a sort of like a black plastic kind of cladding there, the way you'd expect to find a grill, which you don't need, just seems a bit, it's okay, but I'd rather they did something different with it. And they have, and I love the way this lights up at night. It looks sensational on the front of the car. Um, cooling's done down at the bottom, as you'd expect, all the kind of airflow goes in through there and you get on the Sportline car you get these kind of black um, addenda here but with the VRS it gets this extra kind of fin in it as well and of course the VRS gets everything kind of blacked out on it which you'll see as we go around the car they got a more much kind of mean more kind of muscular look to the car you get the big proud Skoda badge inset into sort of like the bonnet there and of course you get the kind of the twin bulges of the bonnet that just sort of like sit atop these this kind of shaped crystal face as I say it's a good looking car this from the front and of course the biggest change is in of course the side profile because you can see that real sloping rear roof line which doesn't actually hurt practicality too much but we'll go on to that in the practicality section. Um, what do you get around the side? Well of course you get your little kind of VRS badge up here with a kind of acid kind of green kind of uh, tinge to it. Alloy wheel sizes, they're 20 inches standard but you can option 21s, these are the standard 20 inch wheels which are quite nice. I'm not a big lover of black wheels but they're alright. As I say, Everything else is kind of blacked out, as you can see, so there's no chrome 
around the side of the car at all. It's all kind of dark and blacked out. This is velvet red metallic, which is an optional paint finish on the car, which makes it quite kind of striking. Um, although I think maybe a black or a grey would make it a bit more kind of sophisticated looking. The VRS sits a little bit lower as well, so you've got 15mm lower um, ride height at the front and 10mm lower at the back. As I say, it's not a particularly tall car, and in some ways, in terms of when we talk about competition, it kind of maybe sort of like, I don't know, it reminds me of a kind of slightly jacked up kind of normal size five door family hatchback, you know, like a Ford Monday or a Vauxhall Insignia. So if you're coming from a car like that, maybe moving into a sort of SUV or crossover, this is probably not a bad move for you. Sits that little bit higher on the ride height, as I say, than a standard car, a bit like a Polestar 2 does. But, as I say, it's this part here where it's different over the kind of standard ENYAC and it just swoops back into this kind of truncated tail at the back here. Nice kind of strong crease down the shoulder line there, but nothing superfluous down the side. As I say, it's a handsome looking car, the ENYAC, anyway. Have they made it more handsome with it being the coupe? Well, let's take a look around the back and find out. So, what have we got? Well, we've got obviously the standard kind of ENYAC kind of tail lights. The VRS model gets this red reflective strip along there. So you get it in a Sportline trim as well, um, which gets the kind of black bits. But as I say, the VRS gets this added red reflective strip along through that bottom bit of the bumper there. Of course, you get your big Skoda lettering across the back here, your IV there, and your Enyaq badge there. Um, tucked up underneath you here, you get your little reverse uh, camera as well. Um, boot releases underneath the, there, which Gets your hands a bit filthy, especially on the kind of winter days like we've got just now. And then, of course, your parking sensors around the back. And thank you, Skoda. A rear wiper. Thank you. Thank you. See? Sensible. Sensible Skoda. What do we think? Look, if you're a regular viewer, you'll know that I'm not a big lover of coupe SUVs. I don't really see the point in them. And if I'm being absolutely truthful about it, I sort of prefer the standard ENYAC. But I do get that there'll be people that do like this car and as I say making it a coupe hasn't hurt it too much when it comes to practicality which obviously we'll now move on to but before we do what do you think does this tick your box does it tickle your pickle is this the ENYAC that you would buy purely on a style basis as always let us know in the comments down below so as I say making it a coupe does hurt the practicality but not as much as you'd actually think, because the standard Enya is such a big car anyway. 585 litres of boot space in a standard car, and the coupe only loses 15 litres when it drops to 570 litres. Now, bear in mind, that is still 70 litres bigger than the BMW iX flagship that we tested last week on the channel. There you go. Massive boot. That's, that's, that's more than enough. <clears throat> now, there's various different options you can have on the car as well, and we'll go on to prices and options in the pricing section, because um, that is one of my wee bugbears with it. But you get a thing called a transport pack, where you've got this nice kind of natty way of releasing the rear seats. You've got handles here, we just pull those, and the rear seats release. So you've got a 60-40 split rear seat, but you've also got a load-through facility as well, through the centre, which is quite handy. The other thing I love about the ENYAC is these silly little things like... You know, just the little hooks that you get that flip down so you can just hang shopping bags on it from either side. Absolutely perfect. There's some underfloor storage for your cables in here. So you can get those dropped down in there. And there's also another bit of storage here where it comes to this natty Skoda bag for your home uh, three-pin charger, which goes in there. Um, and you can also option up with a deployable electric tow bar, which comes down from here. So if you are... Um, using the car for towing, but it's caravanning or a small trailer, there you go. 1,400 kilos um, a brake trailer that you can uh, tow with the ENYAC VRS, uh, which is good. And that just kicks out of the way when you don't need it. Does it fit the suitcases? Well, of course it does. Um, there's a large suitcase going in there. We've got a, in fact, actually, what you can do is you can put this smaller carry-on right up against the back seats there. Still get the medium one down the side there. Carry on there. And enough room for either another carry on or a rucksack or anything else that you want in there as well. So plenty of space when it comes to the actual boot space of the car. So yeah, it hasn't really lost too much of its practicality. Now of course, <clears throat> rear seat space 
could be affected by it as well in terms of headroom because you've got that sloping roof line. But actually it's okay. I mean, I know I'm short. I mean, as I say, I'm five foot seven, five foot eight, and, and I've got, you know, enough room. You can feel it, you know, where it is obviously um, being much more kind of raked at the back. So I think if you're over six foot, you might, you might find your head brushing it on occasion. It is helped in part by this lovely big standard fixed glass panoramic roof, um, which not only makes the headroom just that little bit better, but also floods the interior with light to make the car feel a bit more spacious. And I really like that, and it's standard on the car too. Um, they have kind of turned it effectively into a four-seater in some respects, because you've got this storage bin on the floor here, rather than having the flat floor across, like you do in the in, in the standard Enyaq. Um, and in this car, you've got rear climate control, and there's two USB-C ports down there. Again, there's a few options in this car, and I must admit, I'm quite kind of confused by it, because the spec sheet that Skoda sent me didn't really mention some of these options, but looking through the website when I was doing, you know, my kind of research, a lot of this is optional. You know, these lovely, oh, hang on, these lovely kind of rear blinds, all the rest of it, but yeah, they're, they're part of an option pack. And there's quite a few options to go through on the car. But anyway, that's by the by. Um, what else can I say about the rear seat accommodation other than the fact that, as I say, it, it's plenty big enough in some ways. There's some storage. You've got the kind of mat pockets on the backs of the seats with another little kind of bit in there for storing maybe like a phone down or something like that. There's decent enough door bins um, that are shaped for water bottles. They're not lined like they are in the front, but they're there and they're good. Um, <clears throat> as I said, there's a flip down. Uh, armrest which gives you not just cup holders in it as well but also gives you access to the load through facility so if you're carrying skis or a longer load or you know you've got something to, to carry along there like poles or whatever or fishing rods or whatever you can do that easily enough the other thing that I like as well obviously being a father with the ice fix nice and easy to get to the ice fix points the little covers that just flip down you're not jabbing the the prongs of the seat into the into the um the, between the leather squab and backrest nice and easy and you also get another isofix point on the front passenger seat even with these standard sports seats that you get in the vrs so in terms of practicality actually turning it into a coupe hasn't affected it too much um as i say it's a bit odd having this kind of ornament storage there where you don't obviously you can't have a center passenger's feet there although you can have a center passenger because there's enough space for them um other than that it's not really too bad back here. Hmm. Stylish and practical. And up front, well, it's pretty much as we expect with the Enyaq, which is to say it's a good place to be. Um, there are some things which um, we'll go through, which I'm not 100% convinced about now. I've spent a bit more time with the car. Um, but on the whole, let's start with the good stuff. So the design of it, I love, I really like this. I think... This is probably the best interior of these MEB cars, you know, the, the, the between the ID4, uh, the Enyaq, and, and possibly even the Q4 e-tron. I really like the Enyaq's interior. Um, I think I prefer it over the Audis. But anyway, you've got a very small 5.3-inch display, which is sort of buried into the dashboard here in front of the driver. And I quite like that. I quite like where it is. I like the design of it. I like the fact that it's, it's tucked in there. I'd like it to give more information much like I would on sort of the Volkswagen IDs and the Cooper Bonds. Um, only really Audi or of the group give you the promised standard kind of dials with all the information that you'd expect. For some people, there'll be enough in there. For others, they may want a little bit more, but that's what you get. Um, the main um, thing that you get, and obviously in the interior, is this big 13-inch um, infotainment screen, which is way better than the Volkswagen's uh, ID4 and ID5 system. Um, Audi and uh, Skoda seem to have their own um, software, I think, and whatever they use in there, and it is good. It's still a tiny bit laggy. It's not quite as quick as you'd want it to be. Um, you know, I, 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 that's the only thing I can really fault it for in terms of its user interface. It's not quite as quick as you'd want, maybe, or you get in some other cars. But one brilliant thing about it is you do sort of lose those touch sensitive controls that you do on the Volkswagen. There is touch sensitive controls here for volume, um, you know, where you can up the volume or down the volume. However, better than that, you've got a scroll wheel on the steering wheel, 
which is a physical uh, button which is much easier to control so although you do still have the volume on that kind of slide control there at least you've got a physical button there so it's only really the passenger that affects the other good thing is the climate control whilst it is in this menu the the basic functionalities are there so they're always on so for instance your temperature adjust is always there your heated seat is always there um you, you know so it's always on you can always get it quickly there is physical buttons down the bottom here so for instance the climate menu is a climate button so you press that and it brings it straight up now, if you've watched our Cupra Born review, our long-term test car, um, my wife um, w was saying that there was too many layers to do something basic, just like turn the heated seat on um, or adjust the fan speed. This is much better. This is much, much better. Yes, it's still in the screen, but there's not as much layers to go through to get to the bit that you actually want. And it's only really maybe some of the factual fine-tuning um, which is done through the screen. Um, you do get... Um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are standard, and wireless charging, which is done via down here, so that's pretty good, that's pretty decent. And as I say, there are physical buttons along the bottom here for certain things, so for your mode, for instance, if you want quick access to your driving mode, you press that, um, and that brings it up, up on the screen there, you park assist, um, you know, you obviously your hazards, locking, climate control, and then maximum defrost and rear screen defrost functions there on physical buttons there so good it's a lot much it's a lot better and the screen itself is a much nicer screen it's much bigger it's clearer um, than you get in the volkswagen so that again much as we've had with the enyaq in the past i really do like that and i say it's easy to get on with the only downside as i say if you are using sort of like say the car's navigation um as i say it, it's still that little bit laggy just to sort of like go from one bit to another there should be maybe a faster maybe that's something that will happen with updates who knows all right let's move on from that um center console area here that's the same um two cup holders which don't take either my water bottle or my big coffee flask they're too small the cup holders <clears throat> thankfully excuse me thankfully there is a shaped bit down in the door where I can get one of them down in the door bin and the door bins are lined with felt so it doesn't rattle around so that's okay that's a bit of a disappointment though but you do get this kind of storage tray here you get your nice little kind of lozenge uh, transmission selector which I like it's nice and easy to use and out of the way and underneath here there's bags of storage as well there's another storage tray underneath You've also got this lift up armrest and um, we've got some storage as well which is a, a little thing you can take out if you want a kind of two stage one but there's certainly more enough space for some snacks if you want that which is also very very good I like that and that armrest also adjusts for height as well which I do like which brings me on to the driving position which is excellent it's very very good now the VRS gets these sports seats as standard uh, which are electrically operated on the driver's side only. It's manual adjustment for the passenger, unless you option up um, another one of these packs. I think it's the Max Pack or something like that. It gives you the, the electric adjustment as well on the, on the passenger seat. There's just a bewildering array of options on the car. Uh, you get a different steering wheel on the VRS to the standard car, which has a normal two-spoke steel uh, steering wheel. On the VRS, it's three-spoke little vrs badge there it's a nice wheel to hold perforated kind of leather on the side leather is standard as well on the car um so you do get that as standard and there's a good range of adjustment in terms of the seat i can tip, tilt the front of it right up so lift underneath my, my thigh support i get a good range of adjustment on the steering column as well reach and rake um so that's all good the column stocks fall nice and easily to hand so the lights on the left your wipers on the right and again nothing fancy they work as you'd expect them to work the physical buttons on the steering wheel thank you skoda um where you get as i say the scrolling wheel for the volume on this side um and then obviously you know for scrolling through various functions on the left sorry on the right side and um, where you've got your cruise control your lane keep assist and your configuration of your dashboard there and then it's your media buttons here uh, with a heated steering wheel as well located in there the other nice thing is as you're driving along they're, they're mounted quite far in so you're not tending to hit them with the heel of your hand which is good two paddles behind the steering wheel again for adjusting brake regeneration so you've got you can go into just b mode on the transmission lever here 
or you've got three levels of brake regeneration which you can adjust via these two paddles here. Excellent. Uh, on the door, we've got things like obviously mirror switches and unlike Volkswagen, Skoda see fit to give you four electric window switches um, which are physical buttons so you don't have to press a button and then operate a window switch. Simple, don't know why Volkswagen don't do that but Skoda do, thank you very much. And then just down where my right knee is there's some little ancillary buttons so things like rear fog lights and actually the light switch down there as well. Um, so yeah, on the whole, a brilliant cabin. Um, VRS gets, as I say, apart from the leather and the stitching, the VRS logo stitching the headrest, you get this kind of carbon look inlay on there. And then that's the other thing in terms of its quality. It is absolutely fantastic. It's way above Volkswagen. It's it's probably Audi level now in terms of the fit and finish of the Enyaq. You know, so you get this nice soft touch kind of material section of the dashboard here, kind of nice kind of squidgier plastics. Uh, rubber up on top of the, the dashboard there. Yeah, there's some harder plastics on the door, but it's not too bad, and I don't think it actually detracts from the interior. You get a nice kind of chrome door handle, little chrome flashes around the rest of it, and um, some nice stitching work. Um, and as I say, the overall, the feeling in here is something of a real quality car, um, which is something I don't really find that I got with the Volkswagen ID4 and ID5. The Enyaq does it much, much better, in my opinion. So, yeah, if they can fit some bigger cup holders, I'd say there's very little to complain about in the interior of this car. Now, there's going to be three models available in the Enyaq Coupe range, and they all get the same size of battery, which is the 82 kilowatt hour one. So, in terms of its usable size, I think it's about 77 kilowatt hours. And on the VRS, that gives a WLTP range of 323 miles. Now, one of the biggest issues we had with Enyaq when they first launched it was its very, very low charging speed. Skoda has changed that now. They made it an option. It was an option you had to, to have to if you wanted a bigger charge, a faster charging speed. That's now standard. It will charge at speeds up to 125 kilowatts, which is much, much better, if a little bit behind some of the others in class. But you can still go from a 10% to 80% charge from one of those rapid chargers in 36 minutes. If you're using your 7 kilowatt wall box to charge up overnight, then you're looking at around about 13 hours from absolute empty to absolutely full. Now, whilst the Enyaq Coupe only comes with one battery size, you are going to have the option of three power outputs depending on the model that you go for. So it's going to start with a single motor um, version, rear wheel drive, at 203 brake horsepower. And then you go up to the ATX, um, which is an all wheel drive car, so dual motors, at 265 brake horsepower. Then you've got this, the VRS, which is 299 brake horsepower. Well, I say that, but the thing is, that amount of horsepower is only available in very short bursts of time, in other words, 30 second intervals to give you maximum acceleration. And even then, it's only available when the battery has enough charge in it. So you're paying all that money to have that extra horsepower, which might not be available to you depending on the situation of the car. Now, I've got a bit of an issue with that. I don't think that's particularly, well, correct, if I'm honest with you. I think that's a bit mean. If you're paying the money for the VRS, I want the VRS's power all the time. I find it a bit odd. It has a 0 to 60 time when you've got that 299 horsepower available to you of six and a half seconds. So it's not blindingly fast, it's quick. Let's just call it that. You know, I mean, Kia Nero, Kia EV6 with, with less power than that does it in just over seven seconds. So, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I feel a bit short-changed. And I do wonder, and I know this is going to sound really odd, but I do wonder whether or not it's sort of Volkswagen sort of like saying to Skoda and Cooper and you can't be more powerful than us. We've, we've got to be. You can't have a car that's quicker than us. So I'm not really sure why you'd opt for the VRS at this point. This is my point with this car. And it doesn't feel, even when you put it into the sport mode, now you go into your modes, um, there's a button here, the physical button here. You enter your modes and it comes up on the screen and I'm going to sport. And you need to be in sport to get that power, but you need to have more battery than I have at the moment. And if I put my foot down now, 
it's not what I'd call an electric kind of response from the throttle. It feels quite heavy and it just doesn't feel as fast as I'd want something with the VRS tag to be. I am a little bit disappointed with this if I'm honest with you. And when it comes to the handling as well, again, it's not, it's okay. It's, it's absolutely competent at what it does. But again, for the money and the badge that it's wearing, I want it to be more than competent. Obviously in the sport mode, your steering weight's up, you've got a bit more kind of weight behind it, but I don't think it gives any more feel. I don't think it gives a, any more kind of communication, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I just kind of, I'm struggling to see the point, if I'm honest with you. Um, what else is, well, there's different driving modes, as I say, so you can go into, uh, depending obviously what you want, you've got Eco Normal Sport Traction, which obviously is for when the weather's like it is at the moment, and it kind of dulls things back a little bit to have better grip. And then you've got an individual mode where you can set things up as a driver, so the steering would have a different feel to the throttle, having a different feel to everything else. So you can do that, um, and that's quite good. But again, I, I don't think there's enough of a difference in some respects to maybe warrant it and I'm not sure many people will bother with that individual mode if I'm completely honest um, what else to say uh, well the driving position is excellent the driving position is very good these seats are lovely and these figure hugging VRS seats they're very good they hold you in the right place they don't tend to pinch you even if you have a larger frame like myself um, they're all right they, you know there's enough support there's certainly enough under thigh support you get a good driving position uh, I like the steering wheel you know this nice sort of like three spoke kind of sports steering wheel feels very good in the hand um, it's got a nice girth to it, you know, it just feels right. All the controls fall easily to hand. The brakes are pretty decent, they're okay. Um, they're, you can adjust the regeneration via the paddles um, on the steering wheel, which is nice. I like that. Um, the drive of the car itself is, is good. Um, I think I have to clarify myself a little bit here. If this sounds like I'm being hard on the car and I don't like it, that's not what I'm trying to say. I love this car. This, I really like this car. I really, really do. But the bits that I like about it are the bits that I like about a normal Enyaq. That's what I'm trying to say. All the bits that are great about the VRS, all the bits I love about this car, are all the bits that I love on a standard Enyaq. I just, this is my point, I don't think there's enough to justify the VRS, that's what I'm trying to say. Interestingly, my wife's been, sorry, I'm just going through a width restriction, I'll just, there we go, because I knew it was going to beep at me. Um, my wife's been driving this car, and if you're a regular viewer, you'll know that she drove, um, she drives quite a lot of the cars that I have, and I like getting her opinion on them, and she obviously, she drove the Cooper Born that we had quite a bit, which is another car from the MEB platform. She prefers this. Um, she said, and I thought it was quite an interesting comment she made, she says, it feels like a very grown up car. And I don't think she meant it was just for old people. She says there's a feeling of sort of like real maturity to it. There's a feeling of a, a solidity to it, a refinement. She says it doesn't feel light and flighty. She says it feels solid on the road. She says she really liked driving it. Um, but when I said to her, you know, well, that's the sports model, even she was like, well, it didn't feel that fast. And I said, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's the VRS, it's, it's the, you know, 300 horsepower. She went, she said, I wouldn't have said that if you'd asked the question. So that's what I'm trying to convey. The basic recipe of the Skoda Enyaq is still here. And all of that is very, very good. It's just, as I say, the VRS tag on it, it's not enough. They, it feels like they've held back there isn't enough of a difference for me. And and that's when I feel that maybe this isn't really the Enyaq I would choose. Possibly the one I would choose is further down the range. See, the ATX Sportline, when we had that against the GTX ID, ID4 and the Audi Q450 uh, e-tron, that was the car we said was the one, the Enyaq, that we all loved, the ATX Sportline with the 265 horsepower and just enough. And I think that's the one I would choose personally. 
yeah the suspension's good uh, there's a nice it doesn't feel it feels good on the road it doesn't wallow around in the corners um, there's like you know it takes a nice flat line through a corner you'll probably hear there's a little bit of a bump thump when you've got some really severe um, transverse ridges across the road but it's it's noisy rather than uncomfortable if that makes sense you can hear them but you're not really feeling them um, which is nice I think that's a really good they've managed to get the suspension set up really nicely on this so that's the one thing I will say about it is another good thing the brakes feel better than the Volkswagens um, I'm sure there's also a similarity there but I have to say that the brakes certainly feel better um, than I've tried in say like the ID4 and the ID5 but yeah I'm still not convinced on this VRS badge I'm still not convinced this is this is the one now if you're of a certain age like I am you'll remember Skoda has always been a bit of a budget brand that is certainly no longer the case. Now, the Skoda Enyaq Coupe is going to come in three different models, um, three different trim levels, but we're focusing on the VRS uh, here, and that starts at £54,370. Now, Skoda say the price of this car that I've got on test seat is just over £56,000, according to the little spec sheet they sent me, but I think it's more than that because there's some options on this car that I've found that they hadn't put on the spec sheet, so I think this is probably closer to probably £57,000, £58,000 as tested. And you could probably go a little bit higher still if you really went crazy on the options list. Now, that's a lot of money. That is a huge amount of money, in my opinion. And I think it's just bordering on questionable whether you'd want to spend that level of money on this car. Now, the other thing to think about as well in terms of running costs, um, the warranty that you get with the Skoda, which is a little bit disappointing because it's only three years. It's unlimited mileage for the first two, but then they say the third year is either three years or 60,000 miles. So I'm assuming that you're only limited to 60,000 miles over the three years, which is way behind the likes of Hyundai and Kia. It's seven years. Your servicing intervals, however, are every two years, and they should be quite reasonable because there's not a huge amount to do on the car. So where does competition for the Skoda Enyaq Coupe come from? Well, its main competition comes from within Volkswagen Group itself, with, of course, the ID5 and Audi's Q4 e-tron Sportback, which, like the Skoda Enyaq, are available in single-motor and lower-powered versions or dual-motor higher-powered versions. But let's move away from Volkswagen Group for a second and think about what else is available out there if you're after a sort of coupe-like SUV crossover. Well, of course, there's Volvo's excellent C40 Recharge, and Ford's Mustang Mach-E is probably very, very similar in terms of its sort of style and its capaciousness. From Kia, there is the rather excellent EV6, and its premium sister brand, Genesis, with the brilliant GV60. If you were to think maybe a little bit more outside the box, then maybe you'd consider maybe something like the Polestar 2 as a rival. I'm not sure about it. It's, it's, it's more of a saloon car, that, to me. But maybe some people with a slightly, slightly raised ride height might see that as a more natural rival for it. Certainly price-wise, it's on the money with this car. Um, but if you were to look away from the more coupe-styled SUVs, then you've got to consider from the premium brands of Mercedes-Benz and BMW, things like the Mercedes EQA350, and of course, BMW's rather brilliant new iX1. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new Skoda Enyaq Coupe VRS. We like its styling, its interior styling and fit and finish, the space that is still on offer, its build quality, and its reasonable range and efficiency we don't like. It can get expensive with options and the fact that many of those things are actually optional and not just that but the price of those options and the main one for us at the VRS just doesn't feel sporty enough. Since its launch, the Enyaq has always been one of our firm favourites here at Auto EV. Of all the sort of like Volkswagen Group MEB cars, it's the one that sort of brings most to the table, in our opinion. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you'll know that I'm not a huge lover of these coupe-style SUVs, but I'm probably in the minority in some respects because manufacturers obviously see a market there. 
and there's plenty of them around. Well, here is another one to add to the burgeoning ranks of those. Does it offer anything over the standard car, however? <clears throat> well, you don't lose a lot of practicality with it. And in some respects, maybe in terms of the way the aesthetics are, some people may prefer this sort of coupe style. But is the VRS the ENYAC of choice? No, not for me. You see, for me, there just isn't enough there. There isn't enough difference there, enough dynamics there, enough difference in the way it performs over something like, say, the 80X Sportline to justify the much higher cost, in my opinion. No, to me, the best ENYAC that you can buy isn't the top of the range one. It happens much further down the range. It is a pure and simple case of when less is actually more. The VRS is a prime example of them going a little bit too far when it's not really needed. Much like Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. <gasps> Thank you very much for watching another road test review on Auto EV. As always, please make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. And once you've done that, make sure you've pressed the little bell button so you receive notification of when our next video goes live. If you liked the video, then please make sure that you also give it a thumbs up and leave us your comments. What do you think of the new Skoda Enyaq VRS Coupe? Am I wrong? Do you think it's the car that was worthy of the VRS badge? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below as always. Remember we're across all social media platforms as well, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn, so please give us a follow there as well because every little bit helps. And if you've got, I don't know, a few hours to waste this afternoon, whenever you're watching this, then stick in our YouTube channel because there's now well over a hundred videos on there, not just road test reviews, but electric icons, van reviews, twin tests, used car reviews and of course motorbike reviews from our guest presenter, Charlie Berman. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching and supporting the channel. I'll see you again soon. So, you've watched our video. It's now my job to tell you to like and subscribe and press the little bell button to receive notification of when our next video is uploaded.